So, hey, if you're supposed to be at work at 8 o'clock or so, you are late. And we got bumper to bumper on 25 South at the I-70 interchange and a fender bender on East Colfax, so you better beware. Well, it looks like another summer Monday in the Mile High City. Beautiful this morning, high near 90, and a chance of dribbles and thunder bumpers in the p.m. Now here we go for 10 in a row. It was a beautiful morning, and for most residents of Denver, it was starting out pretty much like any other July day. But on the city's outskirts, after nearly a decade of work, a group of researchers from MIT's Lincoln Laboratory and the National Center for Atmospheric Research were readying a new Doppler radar wind shear detection system for its ninth day online. This is the story of the events of that day, July 11, 1988 a day that at least four flight crews on approach to land at Stapleton International Airport will remember as the day all hell broke loose. Where to start the story? Well, probably here with the new system. A system that will automatically identify and report the location, intensity, and direction of movement of wind shear events that could be hazardous to air traffic. A Doppler radar, sighted specifically for the airport and using sophisticated ground clutter suppression techniques, searches the airspace in a 50-mile radius of the terminal area. The massive amounts of raw radar data indicating the reflectivity, the velocity, and the spectrum width of a storm are so complex and updated so often that it requires sophisticated computer technology to process and present the information to controllers in a simple format, showing the alert notification, the runway segment affected, the predicted airspeed loss, and location. Now, because this was an operational test, the decision was made to have a trained meteorologist monitor the system to ensure that no wind shear event of 20 knots or more occurring in less than two and one-half nautical miles went undetected. Bill Mahoney was working the operations center on July 11th. Here's how he remembers the day. At Stapleton, there was very little weather for most of the day until about 3.30 in the afternoon when the thunderstorms began moving off the mountains. And then about three or four minutes after four, I looked on the radar screen and noticed this very, very strong but very close uh, microburst that was just south of uh, the east-west runways. And at first I didn't believe it because it was the strongest, tightest couplet and velocities I'd ever seen. Fortunately, the TDWR algorithms did alarm on the microburst in a timely way and we knew that the uh, system was functioning as planned. We were just a little bit nervous of the fact that there were aircraft continuing to arrive uh, through the event. And continuing to arrive, they were. In all, five flights were inbound to Stapleton's east-west approach corridor. Four will eventually encounter the now building microburst. And the fifth will make an early decision to avoid. Who wants to go missed? United 862, we'd like to go out to the right here if we can. United 862, change runway to 35 right, cleared to land. I do have a microburst alert that runway. Wind 35015, a 40 knot loss on a three mile final. Uh, we don't want to make any approach. We'd like to go out and hold somewhere until you stop getting the microburst alerts. The next flight end trail was United 395. First Officer Bernie Dolan was the pilot flying, and he remembers the afternoon very clearly. The ATIS uh, reported uh, low-level wind shear, which is standard. You get that uh, probably 50% of the time at least uh, every, uh, all summer in Denver. And uh, there was a great uh, large dew point uh, spread, and, uh, and they were calling the winds uh, about a three-knot tailwind uh, on final. And uh, we were uh, uh, ducking in and out, uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, the uh, cumulus clouds. And the uh, bumps were significant. 
particularly at the lower altitudes. I think over Kiowa, we uh, asked for a descent down to uh, 14,000 feet, and, uh, and it was uh, very uncomfortable at 14,000 feet, uh, moderate turbulence. Uh, we uh, managed to get clearance on down to 11,000 feet, driving in uh, at 11,000 feet uh, toward Altura. And uh, as we approached Denver, uh, the visibility was very good. You could see a long ways, but there were many small uh, clouds, not uh, heavy, uh, clouds that you could almost see through with a lot of virga. Uh, we, were gonna, we were planning to fly at uh, 20 knots high. Uh, normally only 10, but uh, the, the uh, conditions were, were right, and we had uh, decided to fly 20 knots uh, above uh, ref. So uh, we wanted to get it down and get it on the ground and get the airplane stopped was my main consideration. By seven minutes after four, the tower was receiving this alert, and this was the result. United 395, Denver Tower, runway 26 left, clear to land. Wind is 2105, a 409 watts, one mile final microburst alert, not substantiated by aircraft. That got my attention, and uh, I started, uh, uh, I, was, I was itching at the throttles. I was, had the power up, and uh, the speed was up, and we were just a little bit high yet, but uh, getting down there. I'd gone back to flaps 30, and uh, uh, all of a sudden we got the whoop whoop pull up. Whoop, whoop, pull up. We got it twice. And uh, uh, I pulled the nose up slightly and as, it, as we got the first whoop, whoop, pull up. And with the, after the second one, it uh, ceased. But at the same time, the airspeed began to drop. And it dropped quickly. Within, uh, within a second or so, uh, maybe slightly more than a second, I'd say it dropped 10 knots. The captain said, uh, let's get out of here. Uh, there was already a little rain on the windshield, and the uh, runways were wet by this point. I, uh, immediately went to uh, take off thrust, brought the nose up to a uh, take off pitch attitude, and uh, in, during the rotation there was a, a little bit of a sinking a feeling, and within, uh, I would say, just a second or two, we uh, seemed to be climbing nicely. The airspeed began to increase. United 395 was the first of what would eventually number four flights to go around before the microburst dissipated. The next flight, United 236, was approaching Stapleton on a trip from Seattle. Captain Jerry Bear picks up the story. And as uh, we approached a marker, coming up, we had everything done, and the uh, approach speed that day was 140 knots. So as we come down, the co-pilot was flying, he slowed to 140 knots, we started down, and uh, I could see Virga coming out of the cloud. And both pilots looked and said, well, you know, let's put on 10 more knots for Grandma, you know, or whoever you want to put the speed on. So I, I asked Dan to put on another 10 knots of speed, which we did. And we were about 150, and this kind of like a wave hit the airplane. And uh, the airplane was, as I said, kind of felt like it was backing up and was rotating up on its axis like this and he was shoving forward on the yoke and pulling the power back and then we had no power in the airplane and within probably five to seven seconds we went from 150 knots to 210. But it was, it was smooth all this time, it was smooth. And then you, know, you get that, well, it's going to end shortly and that's when I told the co-pilot better to get full power, we're, we're going around. And uh, he came up with full power and then it just like it gave out and then, but. Then we had violent bursts from, from the, I guess would be the microburst. But uh, lining up with two six left, it would take the airplane and move it sideways, maybe 200 feet. It just boom, sideways this way. This way we'd go sideways. And we're going up and down, you know, constantly going up and you know, The nose is up, we're on a kind of go around attitude. I could see the ground. And I said, I would guess we were 500 feet above the ground. We maybe lost four or 500 foot coming out, washing out of the thing. And uh, we were probably 500 feet with the nose up, trying to go around with takeoff power. And said we stayed at 500 feet uh, about 55 seconds. They said, and I said we should have been climbing probably 35, 4,000 foot rated, but we weren't going anywhere. So, and this thing had the death grip on us for <laughs> to take us on through, you know. And as we got to the east or the west part of the field, we kind of flew out of it and went around, you know. 
By this time, United Flight 949 had crossed the Kiowa Fix and was being vectored by air traffic control toward 26 left, a path that would place it on a collision course with the still growing microburst. I tell you, United uh, 949 to Mark Grinman. Uh, 949, call flight 0, send a heavy DC-8 is going around ahead, microburst alert, threshold wind 0, 09 or 0, 3, expect a 7 0 knot loss on a 3 mile final. And like the preceding flights, United 949 would make the decision to go around. But that isn't the end of the story. The final flight to be affected was United Airlines Flight 305, inbound from Des Moines. Captain Bill Dudgeon was flying. We turned base leg, and some were on base leg or just about final. Uh, I looked over and noticed an aircraft on low final 26 left, which was executing a go around. Uh, we hadn't heard anything to this point. We hadn't heard anything, as it turned out, of the other three or four airplanes that had gone around ahead of us. But he was going around, he was turning south, and um, we didn't know why, but it was another good cue that something was not quite right. And about that time, we switched over to tower frequency, and they told us, uh, said, Roger, did, uh, you know, at 305, um, I think he said something about a microburst uh, or something, you know, an alert. Um, the wind was so-and-so, and, -so and um, expect or been reported an 80-knot loss. Clear to, I thought I said clear to land. And uh, we looked at each other, Copilot and I, in kind of disbelief. And, uh, we didn't say anything. We just keep the mic and said, would you repeat that? Uh, did you mean eight knot loss or something like that? Cause we, we understood it to mean eight knots. It couldn't be 80 knots. And he said, uh, gave us the same message again. And I said, 80, expect an 80 knot loss. And uh, so he says, what are your intentions? So, well, we're gonna go around, that's uh, our intentions. And we did, we executed go around, push the throttles up, flaps 15, gear up, and um, because at that point, we had no airspeed loss, except we just couldn't slow the airplane down. Uh, we had just the opposite. We had no altitude loss, and uh, so we did a standard go-around procedure, and we had just about got the flaps up to 15 and was into it when we started getting uh, some turbulence, uh, probably um, moderate or so. It shook pretty good for probably until it was uh, in our turn to the north. And so we went around, we were um, 1,000 feet AG, that'd be about uh, 6,500 feet. Our ground altitude was 7,000 feet. And normally, with that airplane, an advanced airplane, I, I believe, uh, when you shove the power up like that, you're gonna pop up to your altitude real, real quick. But we didn't. Uh, it took us from that point all the way over the field and was into our turn, or had just completed it, uh, northbound, when we finally got to our altitude. Yeah, 305, continue your right turn around, uh, heading 010. Ground is 010, beginning to During the same time period, another part of the story was unfolding here, in the tower. Craig Rader was working the local control position that afternoon and remembers the sequence of events very clearly. I remember we were leaving the controller at that point. There was already microburst uh, uh, information on the uh, CRT uh, that was already beginning at that point during the position relief briefing. And consequently, I assumed the position from the other controller, and as the uh, situation went on, uh, the microburst uh, intensities became worse. I believe they started out at 40, and then ended up 50, 60, 70, and at one point, at the uh, worst scenario, it was 80 knots. The next few airplanes after that, to me, just as judgment, as a controller judgment, I issued the information to the pilot, issued the wind, the microburst alert, and it came down to a point where it was like advise your intentions. What would you want to continue the approach or not? I felt at that point that maybe rather than just issuing them a landing clearance, where if they wanted to land, I certainly would have. To where I wanted to more make a point that there was something out there. We've had all these go-arounds. It was obvious to them because we were running visual approaches that day that everybody was going around. To where I was going to give them another option. To where you know, if you don't want to continue the approach, that's fine. We'll do something else. And that's the way I. That's kind of the way that it went as the situation progressed and got worse and worse. Um, it's a good system. I like it. It's definitely a lot better than what we had. Overall. The microburst delayed air traffic for a total of slightly more than 30 minutes. 
but with the exception of some bumpy rides, no one was the worse for wear. Now, let's take a look at what the flight crews knew was there, but couldn't see. Because in most cases, the dynamic movement of wind shear events are invisible. However, when condensed through time-lapse photography, you can see the devastating effect of the microburst. And now, another look at the same microburst. The effect of a microburst of this magnitude easily explains many of the unusual events noted by the flight crews. Because as an airplane enters the headwind segment of a microburst, it will encounter a significant increase in airspeed followed by a downdraft. And then a rapid decrease in airspeed as the plane enters the tailwind segment of the wind shear. In most cases, the way the system detected the microburst and the reactions of the controllers and flight crews would have been considered a tremendous success. But since this was a test, each facet of the operation was evaluated very critically. NCAR's Dr. John McCarthy recounts the evaluation team's conclusions. After the July 11th incident, we took a very hard look at how well the system really operated. And I gotta tell you that the results of that examination were tremendously exciting. The system worked as good as we could have possibly have wanted. The system was able to detect and identify this rapidly developing, very severe microburst. It produced timely warnings to controllers who passed it on to pilots. And as a result of that, the FAA has made a decision to go out and get a bunch of these radars and put them at the nation's airports. So that in the next few years, starting in 90 and extending a couple of years, most of the major airports in this country are going to have a terminal Doppler weather radar system. Now, in any new program, there's good news and there's some bad news. And the bad news uh, is important to us because I have to say that we learned more in 10 minutes than we could have learned in all of the research programs put together uh, in terms of the operational impact of this system. For example, in all of our work in wind shear, we found that so often in these accidents, some flight crew has encountered a severe wind shear, but did not in fact report it on air traffic control frequency. Same thing happened on July 11th. We didn't get a wind shear pilot report uh, into ATC. Now, flight crews are very busy when they're on approach, but it's so important that if you encounter a severe wind shear, get that word out to air traffic control so that others have the benefit of knowing about that severe wind shear. To sum things up, the system did detect and report the microburst and the alerts were valid and timely. So the system's hardware and software functioned well. But a possible problem with the microburst alert information transfer to the flight deck was identified and is currently being examined. However, the decisions of all five crews to go around may be the most important lesson of the afternoon because they graphically illustrate the critical importance of making an early avoidance decision. So, all in all, I guess you could say, things went very well on that July day that all hell broke loose. <laughs>